As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Look, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. You only live today once. Why do it alone? Branch together. Welcome to Branch Together, where we read and reflect on one chapter of the Bible every weekday. We've been walking through Hebrews, and this name Melchizedek keeps popping up. Who is he? What's the significance here? Before we read today, I want to explain a bit about this shadowy figure, and I think the background will help us a little bit as we go through the chapter. Melchizedek is actually the first priest mentioned in the Bible. We don't know exactly where he came from, and there's no genealogy or record for him. We know he's a priest of the God Most High, uh, Abraham's God. And uh, he first appears right after Abraham's military victory in Genesis 14. The king of Sodom and the king of Salem approach Abraham, and the king of Salem, whose name is Melchizedek, shows hospitality to Abram by pronouncing a blessing on him. In response, Abram gives him a tithe or a tenth of his spoils. We know nothing else about Melchizedek from this account, and we have no idea how he became a priest of the Most High. The only other reference is a quick reference in Psalm 110, which doesn't help us any further with answering who this is. When you take a look outside the Bible to some extra-biblical sources, we see that Melchizedek began to be spoken of as a precursor to the Messiah, a figure that pointed the people towards the Messiah. You can find references to him in Second Enoch, in the Dead Sea Scrolls, and in other Jewish literature. Which brings us to the New Testament, and the only place we find him there is right here in the book of Hebrews, and he seems to be all over the place. So we're going to read chapter 7 now, and then I'll explain a little bit of uh, about why I think he's here. Let's pray. <clears throat> Lord, thank you that as we gather, we know you're with us. God, I pray that your presence is with us today. I pray that those who are struggling for whatever reasons today feels you in their lives. I pray that you speak comfort to them, Lord. Lord, I pray as, as we're faithful in this habit that, that you do speak to us, God. Challenge us, sharpen us, help our lives to be transformed and lit on fire for you and your work and your kingdom. God, you're good and we are so thankful. Be with us today as we read. Open our ears to hear, Lord. Amen. Hebrews chapter 7. Now this Melchizedek, king of Salem, priest of the Most High God, met Abraham as he was returning from defeating the kings and blessed him. To him also Abraham apportioned a tithe of everything. His name first means king of righteousness, then king of Salem, that is, king of peace. Without father, without mother, without genealogy, he has neither beginning of days nor end of life, but is like the Son of God, and he remains a priest for all time. But see how great he must be if Abraham the patriarch gave him a tithe of his plunder, and those of the sons of Levi who receive the priestly office have authorization according to the law to collect a tithe from the people, that is, from their fellow countrymen, although they too are descendants of Abraham. But Melchizedek, who does not share their ancestry, collected a tithe from Abraham, and blessed the one who possessed the promise. Now without dispute, the inferior is blessed by the superior, and in one case tithes are received by mortal men, while in the other by him who is affirmed to be alive. And it could be said that Levi himself, who receives tithes, paid a tithe through Abraham. For he was still in his ancestor Abraham's loins when Melchizedek met him. So if perfection had in fact been possible through the Levitical priesthood, for on that basis the people received the law, 
What further need would there have been for another priest to arise, said to be in the order of Melchizedek, and not in Aaron's order? For when the priesthood changes, a change in the law must come as well. Yet the one yet the one these things are spoken about belongs to a different tribe, and no one from that tribe has ever officiated at the altar. For it is clear that our Lord is descended from Judah, Yet Moses said nothing about priests in connection with that tribe. And this is even clearer. If another priest arises in the likeness of Melchizedek, who has become a priest not by a legal regulation about physical descent, but by the power of an indestructible life? For here is the testimony about him. You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. On the one hand, a former command is set aside because it is weak and useless, for the law made nothing perfect. On the other hand, a better hope is introduced through which we draw near to God. And since this was not done without a sworn affirmation, for the others have become priests without a sworn sworn affirmation, but Jesus did so with a sworn affirmation by the one who said to him, The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind, you are a priest forever. Accordingly, Jesus had become the guarantee of a better covenant. And the others who became priests were numerous because death prevented them from continuing in office, but he holds his priesthood permanently since he lives forever. So he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. For it is indeed fitting for us to to have such a high priest holy, innocent, undefiled, separate from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. He has no need to do every day what those priests do, to offer sacrifices first for their own sins and then for the sins of the people, since he did this in offering himself once for all. For the law appoints as high priests men subject to weakness, but the word of solemn affirmation that came after the law appoints a son made perfect forever. If you didn't listen to the intro of this book, I suggest you go back in and take a look at that. It shows that Hebrews was written to Jewish Christians who were probably dealing with persecution from fellow Jews. The author introduces Melchizedek to show these believers that the lineage of the high priest they serve is greater than the religious establishment around them. Basically, the Jews that were persecuting them were under the authority of the Levitical priests, and the author is showing that Melchizedek is greater than the Levitical line. The people would have to give a tithe to support the Levites, but Abraham himself gave a tithe to Melchizedek. I think this would have encouraged the struggling community. Jesus is the eternal priesthood. He won't die off like the Levites, and and his is the order of Melchizedek which is greater than the priests who were the leaders in the community. To this group that was losing faith, the author is saying, hope is available for you. We see in verse 19 that this community has a better hope than what was provided by the Levite priests. They and we have a hope of a marvelous future that awaits those who persevere in the faith. So for me, I'm reminded that whatever circumstances I'm in, whatever the rulers of the world around me do or don't do, there's a ruler greater than them that will endure forever. See you tomorrow.